Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Grzegorz Zekiert. I'm professor of government and the director of the Center for European Studies. And, um, and it, it is really my great pleasure to welcome you to our first Stanley Hoffman lecture on France and the world. Um, I'm delighted that so many of Stanley's friends colleagues and students uh, are here, um, and I would like to extend my warm welcome to Inge Hoffman. Um, I'm truly grateful to Professor Thomas Piketty, who kindly agreed uh, to inaugurate uh, the series of lectures. Um, I couldn't imagine more fitting speaker for, for this event. Uh, I would also like to thank Art Goldhammer, uh, Elaine Papoulias, and the entire CS staff for all the work to make this event um, happen, uh, especially in this time of La Peste. It was exactly 50 years ago uh, when a brilliant Harvard professor joined forces with a young scholar of Germany, an amazing academic entrepreneur, to establish the Center for European Studies. During the next three decades, Stanley Hoffman and Guido Goldman built a great academic institution that shaped the knowledge of Europe in the US and beyond, and established the dense network of relationship between American and European academia. During its five decades, the center supported and trained generation of scholars of Europe, and has been a place to visit for all uh, brightest European academics, politicians, and, and intellectuals. CS has become really the most recognizable Harvard institution in Europe. Guido and Stanley also endowed the center with the unique institutional culture based on openness, pluralism, and equal respect to everyone, from a shy undergraduate students to staff members, from perplexed graduate students to most famous visitors uh, from Europe. As Stanley used to say, paraphrasing uh, Chairman Mao, CS is the place where we want 100 flowers to bloom. For all of this, uh, we are enormously grateful to Stanley Hoffman and Guido Goldman and all generous donors who supported the center and its mission from uh, its funding. Before I ask my friend and colleague, uh, Peter Hall, uh, to introduce our speaker, I would like to invite someone who was Stanley's uh, student and friend uh, for many years. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Louis Richardson, Vice Chancellor of University of Oxford and Senior Fellow at the CS. Louis, please. Thank you, Jay Gorsh. Wonderful to see you, Inga, and it's absolutely fabulous to be here. What a wonderful occasion. Um, like others, I was a student, a colleague, a friend, and always a fan of Stanley's. And like many of us here, um, my life is a little dimmer since he left. So I think this is just a fabulous way to remember him. I was thinking of this last week when I was at a memorial service in London for somebody, another great figure in international relations, somebody of Stanley's generation, somebody who also, whose approach to the subject and interest in the subject was occasioned by his experience during the time of the Second World War, um, and who contributed enormously to the field. Uh, but there, the similarities ended. It was a fabulous, grand occasion. Uh, it had been perfectly choreographed by the man himself to ensure his grandeur was reaffirmed by every aspect of the event. Um, and it was wonderful in many ways, but utterly different from something Stanley would have organized, which is something like this gathering. It reminded me a little of Patrick Kavanagh's uh, jibe at Yeats when he said, um, remember me with no hero courageous tomb just a canal bank seat for the passerby. And I think Stanley would want to be remembered uh, with a riveting lecture, surrounded by people who cared about the ideas that were being discussed. Um, the other thing that struck me about that gathering last week was the complete absence of women. And I realized that that was one of the many unusual things about 
Stanley, not many men of his generation had so many female friends and students. This was no doubt occasioned by his extraordinary uh, strong mother, his absolutely wonderful and extraordinary wife, Inga, his formidable colleague, Dida. But actually, I think it just speaks to his innate uh, egalitarianism, and, and Jay Gorse just alluded to it. Stanley was oblivious to, to stature. Uh, to, it, it would never have entered his consciousness to consider somebody differently by virtue of their gender, their ethnicity, their nationality, or anything else. Um, so it's so appropriate that we, he should be remembered with a lecture on inequality, an issue that he cared deeply about. Um, and also, of course, a lecture by a Frenchman, a lecture that takes a broad historical sweep, as Stanley always did, and as we know, he was so firmly on the historian's end of political science. Um, given his prodigious capacity to read and absorb at great speed, he, unlike many of us, would have read each one of those 1,065 pages. Um, and by now, he would have, ha have had an incisive three-part critique prepared. Um, he didn't believe in heaven, um, and many of us don't, but it's not hard to imagine him uh, sitting up there somewhere, watching this gathering, enjoying this gathering, uh, saying some devastating things to puncture people's self-importance, so to voce in the course of all discussions, um, and just generally having a terrific time, enjoying the exchange of ideas, enjoying having his friends talk about things that matter, uh, things like inequality, things like the state of the world. And there aren't many um, uh, positives about Stanley's passing, but one of them must be that he didn't live to see the ghastly state of, of politics today because it would have, have depressed him greatly. Um, but again, just to say how thrilled I am to be here, how honored I am to have been invited to, to say a few words. And um, I very much hope that this is just launching a long and fabulous series of lectures in memory of Stanley so that future generations can come to, to know him admire him and love him as so many of us did. So thank you. So it's not uh, easy to choose a speaker uh, to inaugurate a series of lectures in honor of uh, our beloved colleague Stanley Hoffman. Uh, but I think, as Louise just said, uh, Stanley would have approved uh, of our choice. Uh, in his new book, uh, Capital and Ideology, which now looms as large on my shelf as uh, Das Kapital, uh, Thomas Piketty embarks on a richly detailed survey of multiple historical epochs in the service of an argument that highlights the role of ideas in the creation of inequality and in the determination of our collective fate, with the ultimate goal of improving that fate. So my Ouija board doesn't tell me what Stanley would think exactly of the arguments or whether he would agree with them, but I know how much he would value the attentiveness to the lessons of history, the prominence given to ideas in the argument, and the dedication to collective well-being uh, that permeate this work on capital and ideology. Of course, uh, Thomas Piketty is a professor of economics at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris uh, and at the Paris School of Economics. He's justly famous uh, for his pioneering and painstaking, painstaking empirical work uh, on the uh, origins of inequality on top income shares. Uh, he's written many important articles and uh, several other books. And as I think everyone knows, the last of those, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, transformed the global debate about inequality. Uh, Professor Piketty, we're honored to have you here, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, <clears throat> for inviting me for this lecture. I'm, I'm very honored to, to be the first uh, 
uh, you know, lecturer for this uh, Stanley Hoffman uh, memorial lecture uh, about France and the world. So as you can hear, my, my English sounds a lot like France, uh, so at least France will be there uh, uh, in my lecture. But France will also be very present, of course, in my <coughs> thinking about the history of inequality regime, and I will try to illustrate this uh, in this presentation. So let, let me say you know a few words about you know this presentation so in this presentation i'm going to try to give you a sense of uh, uh, you know what's what's in this new book capital and ideology uh, i want to thank art goldhammer which i see here for translating my uh, my my work into english i mean as you can hear from my english you know if i was responsible for the writing of this book in english it would be a very poor english and and uh, my writing in french of course is much better than my writing in english and thanks to art uh, uh, you know the, the book in English. I think you know looks uh, looks a lot like the book in French, which is a <coughs> it is much more readable. That will be uh, that it will be you know if anyone else than Art uh, had uh, translated it. Uh, so this book. Uh, let, let me say I you know I think this book is more interesting than the previous one, Capital in the Twenty First Century, in the sense that I'm you know I'm, I'm so if you read only one of them, you should read this one. Uh, you can read the two if you're really curious. I think this book is better first because it takes a much broader uh, global perspective on the history of inequality regime. So it moves beyond Western Europe, uh, North America, looks at, uh, uh, spend a lot of time looking at India, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, China, Russia, South Africa. So it takes a much broader perspective and most importantly puts uh, the emphasis on the transformation of ideology, uh, which uh, in this book is defined as a system of justification of different levels of equality and inequality in different societies. And the, the basic premise of the book is that we should take seriously these systems of justification because they are always, they always are partly plausible. They are never uh, completely self-serving. They, they are partly self-serving, of course, in many cases, but, but it's always much more uh, complicated than just a pure veil on, on a permanent uh, domination of certain groups over others. Uh, and I, I stress in particular in the, in the book the fact that class position in itself uh, is never uh, enough to determine a theory of, of property, a theory of, of education, taxation, of, of how you organize society. And so there is the role of ideas, there is some autonomy in the production of ideas on how to organize societies. And, and it's really through this uh, uh, joint dynamics of class conflict and uh, uh, learning about justice, uh, which I think we can understand the, the transformation of inequality uh, uh, regime. So in, in this presentation, uh, I'm, I'm first going to describe very quickly, you know, the contents of the book. So this is a, a very long book. I should apologize, especially with Art and Art's wife for, uh, <laughs> you know, how much time it took to translate this book. I thought I would make a shorter book than the previous one, and it turned out to be 50% longer in number of characters. But, okay, we are not in a hurry. You know, you can read it uh, by part. Uh, uh, the issues won't go away. I've also tried to organize the book so that you can enter into the books at different stages. Ob although, obviously, it's better to read it uh, in the order I have organized it. So it's b basically chronological. There are four parts, uh, 70 chapters. The part one is about the transformation uh, between uh, Order society, European societies of orders or trifunctional societies, societies organized with a, a nobility, a clergy, a third estate, to ownership societies. So, with the, the case of France and the French Revolution being a particularly clear case, but I also look at other European trajectories, in particular Britain and Sweden. It's a particularly interesting case because Sweden is viewed today as a sort of very egalitarian country, and I stress how till the early 20th century it was actually one of the most inegalitarian uh, uh, European societies, in particular with a, 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 an amazing and very fascinating sophistication in the way to relate uh, political rights to property rights with a number of votes proportional to property holdings in a way which you don't find in Britain and France, for instance, in the 19th century. And then Sweden, through political mobilization, social mobilization, went to a completely different trajectories. And, and that's a 
sort of one of the central theme of the book is that there's no deterministic uh, uh, cultural uh, culture of equality or inequality and socio political historical mobilization can can change the basic structure of equality and inequality much more quickly than what very often the, the contemporary groups tend to imagine. So part two looks at slave and colonial societies and the way the, uh, uh, the, the, the colonial uh, European state powers uh, completely transform uh, the condition of uh, the, the, the formation of the modern state and the transformation of inequality structure from uh, trifunctional or order societies to um, uh, ownership societies and, and, to, uh, uh, and to the modern state. The, the case of India is particularly uh, important here, uh, where uh, if you want to understand the peculiar structure of inequality in India today, uh, the, 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 the way the colonial uh, uh, power, uh, the British colonial power, uh, contributed to rigidify The, the boundaries between social categories and between the, what, what the British colonizer perceived as the caste structure of India when they arrived into India. This formed a very uh, specific structure which, which today India, you know, Indian governments since independence have tried to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to address uh, through the rule of law, through various systems of quotas and reservations. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's uh, you know, what they've done is the best that could be done. I'm certainly not saying that all of the inequality comes from the colonial time, but, but there was this specific structure of inequality that is due to this specific joint influence on the structure of inequality, which again illustrates the sort of the, the historical construction of inequality and the need to go back through this long uh, comparative history to understand the future. So this is uh, part one, part two. Part three is about the decline of inequality in the first half of the 20th century in particular and the, the great transformation of the 20th century from the ownership societies of the 19th century to the social democratic society of the post-World War II era. I also look at communist and post-communist societies and part four, uh, I will come back to this later, is about the The, what I refer here as the dimensions of political conflict, the, which, by which I mean the changing multidimensional structure of the electorate voting for different groups of parties and coalitions. In particular, I look at what I call here the Brahmin left, which is the way uh, uh, social democratic parties have, have, transfor have transformed the, the structure of the electorate used to be uh, centered on lower socio-economic groups in terms of income, education, wealth in the post-World War II era and have become gradually over time the party of the most uh, highly uh, educated group of the electorate. Um, uh, and and I, I, I argue that this partly explains uh, you know, the, the, the huge uh, decline in electoral participation in the lowest uh, socio-economic groups in recent decades uh, and the, the social nativist temptation and nationalist temptation that we have today. I, I present in the last chapter of the book some perspectives of, of an alternative path for the future, which I think is to some extent, you know, I'm describing evolution which, uh, which are already going on. You know, if we look at the evolution of the public uh, Uh, conversation about uh, inequality, uh, uh, wages, uh, progressive taxation uh, in this country, for instance, in the US, you can see how fast uh, things have been changing and the kind of uh, 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 discussion we've had during this campaign with uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, you know, whatever happens uh, to this particular primary, I think is very different from what we had just four years ago, not to say 10 or 20 years ago. So this uh, 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 ideological change and political change is going on and I'm, I'm simply trying in this chapter to try to put this evolution in, in a broader uh, historical perspective. This path uh, uh, is more complicated than the nationalist or social nativist path which proposes a very simple uh, narrative uh, basically consisting of saying uh, okay if you, you don't you feel you are uh, threatened by globalization, we are going to put border around you and we are going to uh, you know, solve problem by, by eating the Mexican, the Chinese, the Polish, whoever uh, uh, you, we, we claim is hurting you. You know, that's a much easier uh, uh, solution than the kind of uh, participatory socialism or uh, social federalist solutions that I am describing here. But at the same time, uh, 
you know, the nationalist path is not going to solve the problem, it's not going to solve the problem of rising inequality. If anything, it's going to exacerbate tax competition and rising inequality. Uh, it's not going to solve global warming or problems which actually require a lot of international cooperation. So, you know, I think whatever happens, uh, you know, whatever the crisis, uh, will have to, to return to more internationalist and egalitarian uh, solution. So, if you uh, go to this website, you will see the complete set of uh, figures. So this is a book with a lot of empirical historical material, like I think 169 figures and tables. Uh, so uh, and there's another 100 figures and tables that are uh, uh, online in the appendix that I could not include in the book because my publisher started to worry about uh, about this, uh, you know, the potential for this book. So if you go on this on, on this website, you will get all of this material. You will get the complete set of slides which I'm supposed to present today, but which, in fact, you know, I have put together a ridiculously large number of slides, which I'm not going to present. So if you go online, you will be able to find more of the material. Okay, so today, uh, it's the rest of this presentation. I'm going to try to emphasize these four points, but I'm going to go very fast because, uh, you know, it, it, we, we need to have time for the discussion, and I'm really looking forward to answer to your question. So first point is going to be about what I call here the failure of the French Revolution. By which I mean that, uh, you know, there was a, 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 pr a promise of more, a more equal society at the time of the French Revolution, which in practice did not completely materialize in the 19th century, and we'll try to, to see that and understand why. Second point about the role of social mobilization in the reduction of inequality in the uh, first half of the 20th century. I already mentioned the case of Sweden. Third point will be about the rise of inequality in recent decades and stressing the role of post-communism and also uh, the, uh, the failure of Reaganism. And four point about these elements for an alternative path uh, uh, and, and about the slow rise of what I call social federalism and participatory socialism in the book. So let me start with the, what I call the failure of the French Revolution. So what I mean by this is that during the 19th century, uh, we actually see, uh, you know, the, a rising concentration of property and to some extent economic power uh, in a country like France. Uh, the, and, and in effect, you know, it's as if the, the previous religion had been replaced by a new religion about, uh, about property, which is... You know, maybe one extreme illustration of what I mean is the episode of, uh, of financial compensation to s slave owners uh, as, as a sort of extreme form of sacralization of property, which you see at the time of the abolition in 1848 uh, in the French slave islands, which you see also in 1833 with the British ab uh, abolition, but which you also see in the debt you know, that was imposed by France to Haiti in 1825, and which Haiti reimbursed to France until the mid uh, 20th century in order to reimburse the French slave owners for their, slave, their loss of property because Haiti wanted to become independent and cease to be a slave island. And so this is sort of the extreme illustration of the idea of sacralization of property. You know, property rights need to be uh, uh, respected uh, no matter uh, what. Uh, and more generally, the colonial uh, you know, inequality dimension is, is the you know, general illustration of the hypocrisy of the French Revolution with respect to the notion of, of equality. So just to, to summarize some of my findings, so this is the evolution of the concentration of property taking into account all forms of property allowed by the legal system of the different period, including real estate, land, financial assets, business assets. So you can see that during the 19th century, if anything, you have a rising concentration of wealth. So at the eve of World War I, you have almost 70% of all property owned by the top 1% in Paris, as opposed to 2% uh, by the bottom 50%. Uh, so this, you, need, you need to wait until the 20th century, and in particular World War I, uh, uh, World War II to have a significant decline in inequality. Uh, not that the, you know, this decline of the share of the top 1% was mostly to the benefit of the next 20, 30, 40 percent, but from the point of view of the bottom 50 percent, it made little difference. So if you look, you know, today, you know, the bottom 50 percent would have six percent of the wealth in France. I mean, in the U.S., it would be even less than that, maybe two or three percent. Uh, so even though, you know, it's a bit more, six percent is a bit more than two percent in the 19th century, but it's still, of course, very small for 50 percent of the population. And so the top one percent, although it has declined a lot, 
you know, still they have uh, between 20 and 30 percent of total wealth, which will be, uh, you know, four times more than the bottom 50 percent, in spite of the fact that this group is 50 times more numerous. So this shows, you know, the level of concentration of property is not something you would have for income that would not be so spectacular, but for property, you know, the, the the diffusion of property over the 20th century should not be exaggerated. You know, there's been a decline in inequality, but there's been a, a patrimonial middle class that has developed, you know, sort of in between the bottom 50% and the top 1%, if you wish. But, but from the point of view of the bottom 50% or even bottom 60, 65%, depending on the country, you really have almost no uh, access to wealth. And this is also one of the limitations of the social democratic societies in the 20th century, which we, I think, you know, it has to be uh, addressed and resought. Well, unless we believe that this is absolutely the best that can be done in society and that, you know, the bottom 50% has to own nothing at all. But I think this is a, this will be a pretty conservative. Um, uh, uh, interpretation of, of, of this uh, evolution. So for now, coming, going back to the 19th century, so why do we have no uh, redistribution of wealth in the 19th century? Well, largely because the, the, the French Revolution does not really try to redistribute wealth. So the, the, like typically, uh, the ch land owned by the church is nationalized, but this is auctioned to, uh, 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 to property owners who have uh, resources to buy this land, but there's no redistribution toward landless uh, uh, peasants to a large extent. So th there is some discussion uh, at the time of the French Revolution about some progressive tax project, including some progressive land reform. And you probably know uh, Thomas Penn, who was an Anglo-American revolutionary, uh, proposed to institute a progressive tax on inheritance to have a universal capital endowment and land endowment to everybody. Uh, uh, he made this proposal in 1795. And you have other proposal on progressive income tax or progressive inheritance tax, which look a lot like what is going to be adopted like in the US in the 20th century or in other European countries in the 20th century. But at the time, this was not adopted. It was, uh, there was discussion, a lot of uh, brochures at the time of the French Revolution making this proposal on the table, but the balance of power I mean, there was a short time in 1793-94 where some of the uh, proposals, a bit like this, were adopted, but it did not last very long, and, and the balance of power uh, reshifted uh, re in the other direction very fast. So, so in the end, uh, there was never anything like this, and all along the 19th century, you have a flat uh, tax system, in particular on inheritance, and no real attempt to, to redistribute. So if you want to look at, redistribu uh, at redistribution, you really need to go to the 20th century, where you're going to have, uh, in, you know, this is going to be accelerated by World War I and World War II and, and, the, and the Great Depression, but I think it goes beyond that. You had the uh, intellectual and political movement, actually starting even in the 18th century, in the case of this uh, re debate about progressive taxation, but which during the 19th century, especially at the end of the 19th century, you have a generally speaking, a political movement, a socialist movement in particular, demanding more equality in terms of labor rights, uh, uh, social policy, social security, um, uh, progressive taxation. And, and this is, uh, you know, this program, this policy program was sort of ready, or at least largely, had, had been largely discussed before World War I and World War II. And this, I think, largely explained why uh, with this big uh, uh, political and to some extent military shocks and financial crises, you know, this program is going to be implemented, which is a big difference maybe with the situation today where we see the contradiction in the system, but the, uh, the you know, the socialist program, the socialist platform, although it's developing, you know, it's certainly not as strong as what it was at the, at the beginning of the 20th century for a number of, uh, of reasons. So let me simply illustrate so here, this is a graph illustrating the invention of progressive taxation. So this is the evolution of the top income tax rate. So you can see before World War I, the top, in, the, the top tax rate applying to top income was very small. In, I mean, in some, uh, France, in fact, if you look, France in purple was the very last country to introduce the income tax. And that was in the summer of 1914, the law of uh, July 15, 1914. And the law was passed not to get tax revenue to invest in schools, but to get tax revenue to make war with Germany. This was the only thing that made the French Senate uh, pass the law. And so 
you can see, you know, sometimes the way national histories are being instrumentalized and, you know, France likes to present itself as a country of equality, but in fact, as far as the progressive income tax is concerned, France was the very last country to create the income tax, um, largely because the f part of the, of the elite of the French Third Republic will say, uh, okay, we've done the French Revolution, so, you know, we are already a country of equals, uh, uh, we don't need progressive taxation, that's very useful for uh, uh, aristocratic Britain or, uh, or uh, authoritarian Prussia, but, you know, France, uh, we already have equality and everything, so why, why, why we bother with progressive taxation? Whereas, in fact, what my data shows is that the concentration of property up to World War I was just as extreme in France as in other uh, uh, countries. So, in the end, this is going to change. Uh, in particular, the US is going to be the leader in developing progressive income taxation. So, as we know, in the 20s and then with Roosevelt in the 30s, this is going to uh, change with Reagan in the 1980s. Now, what I argue in this book uh, is that if we try to revisit this history today and try to have, uh, you know, a quiet conversation about this, which is very complicated, because once you mention tax rate of 80, 90 percent, you know, everybody gets crazy, uh, uh, everybody tells you, oh no, but this is the Soviet Union, this is Bolshevik, and then you tell, well, no, this is the US, this is Japan, this is Germany, but some people just stop listening and it's impossible to have a conversation. Which is, but you know, this is not going to go away because the con uh, you know this is part of our historical legacy. And what I argue in this book is that if you look, in the end, at this historical time period, this was actually largely successful. You know, this allowed a big reduction of inequality. Uh, uh, if anything, productivity growth and, and GDP growth was higher in this time period than what it has been since 1990. Uh, and also, I think it, it helped build a sense, uh, you know, a social contract, a sense that, uh, uh, okay, everybody needs to pay tax if you want to finance, uh, uh, you know, a public infrastructure, public education, a social security system. But you want to make sure that people at the top pay more than people in the middle or at the bottom. Otherwise, it's very difficult to build uh, a fiscal consent and a sense of a social contract. And, and I think that's one of the big problems we have today. And, and, and this was part of the success in, the, in, this, uh, in this era. Now, we should not be uh, too uh, uh, you know, naive about how this reduction of inequality took place. It also took place through violent shocks, including World War I, World War II, which were themselves, to some extent, the consequence of very large inequality, and in particular, very large international inequality in the context of the, of the colonial system and, and foreign ownership system. So here you have the level of foreign assets owned by Britain and France you know, on the eve of World War I, and you, so this is going to fall with World War I and with World War II, uh, par partly because of expropriation, like Russian bonds are going to be expropriated, or the, you know, the Suez Canal uh, shareholders are going to be expropriated in 1956. But most importantly, this is going to fall because of the war themselves, uh, in order to pay for the war, uh, the, 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 the British and French uh, 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 you know, shareholders and property owners are going to sell a big part of their foreign assets, uh, and which are going to be transformed into into uh, into public bonds. I mean, some of them are going to be uh, sold to uh, U.S. property owners. You know, for the first time, would turn positive in the interwar period. But it's not the the biggest part. You know, the biggest part is 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 really just a big a big fall in this uh, in this uh, in this foreign assets. The competition with Germany is also in itself you know, uh, uh, one, of course, of the key reasons for the World War I and World War II. So there was, you know, every time, you know, the key contradiction in a, in a system of, uh, of, uh, of, of in an, in, you know, in the dynamics of an inequality regime in the way I study them in the book, comes when you have a contradiction between the distribution of economic power and the distribution of political power somehow. So here, at this time, Political power, in particular in the colonial system, was very much centered on France and, and Britain. Uh, but, but in terms of real economic power, Germany had become the dominant demographic uh, and manufacturing power of Europe at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. And this basic contradiction uh, clearly uh, contributed a lot to the big uh, clash uh, that will follow. Uh, and, and so the, the contradiction of this international inequality regime are, you know, a very important part of the of what happened. It's also interesting to remember that so these big foreign assets are going to be transformed into very large level of public uh, debt 30 years later. So if you move uh, 
30 years later, in 1945-1950, you have huge level of public debt uh, in France, Germany, Britain, you know, 200, between 200 and 300 percent of, of national income. Now, what's interesting is that these countries, and in particular France and Germany, are going to decide not to repay this public debt. I mean, they could have decided to repay this public debt, but we will still be repaying it today, you know, because when you have 200 percent, 300 percent of national income, if you have no inflation, no, uh, no, no exceptional uh, reduction of public debt, and you just need to, and you just try to repay uh, uh, with a small budget surplus each year of two or three percent of GDP, you know, this, this takes forever, you know, this could, so we will still be repaying today uh, interest payment to, in effect, people who add. Uh, colonial assets in 1914, or their descendants who then uh, had, had, uh, had these public bonds in, in 1950, and you know this would have been, I think, a very uh, stupid uh, choice. And so the choice that was made in 1950, in particular in Germany, you have this uh, uh, exceptional progressive tax on private wealth, uh, uh, going from less than five percent on low wealth to up to 80, 90 percent on large financial portfolio, which consists a lot of Uh, public debt. So you tax at 90% the public debt to reimburse the public debt, which is a bit trivial, but uh, at the same time, you know, someone has to pay and, and the public debt uh, is not owned by the Mars planet. And, 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 uh, and you have the same policy in Japan, exactly at the same time. And in both cases, this was a huge success because this is what allowed these two countries to start reconstruction uh, without uh, uh, much public debt and with more uh, financial means to invest in public infrastructure, education, etc. So it's important to see how the reduction of inequality in the 20th century came from a radical redefinition of uh, the dominant view about inequality, property, and in some cases, uh, you know, the expropriation of, uh, of property so as to be able to invest in public infrastructure, education, and other uh, priorities. So now let me turn to uh, the, you know, the more recent uh, period and, and the, the maybe the political contradiction of rising inequalities that we have today. One contradiction, I already mentioned it uh, uh, at the beginning of the talk, is what I describe as the rise of the Brahmin left and the fact that the uh, uh, lower socioeconomic groups that they were voting for uh, social democratic parties after World War II uh, have now uh, largely stopped voting for them and how these parties have become uh, parties of the highly educated. So here you can see, if you look at the blue curve, this is the, for the US Democratic Party. So on this curve, what you have is the difference between the vote, the percentage of the vote for the Democratic Party Uh, among the most highly educated and among the lowest level of education. So when it's positive, it means that the highly educated vote for the Democratic Party more than the less highly educated. When it's negative, it's the opposite. So at the, at the, at in the post-World War II period, it was negative in all these countries, which meant that in all these countries, these parties were attracting more support from the lowest level of education. And you can see how this has changed gradually over this time. And so I try to analyze this in the book and I, I argue that the, you know, the, the explanations that are sometimes put forward in the US debate stressing the role of the civic rights movement in the 1960s in particular are not entirely convincing because you, know, you don't have the civil rights movement in, in France or in Britain at the same time and you still have a similar evolution. So I think we have more to try to understand what in the platform of these parties has changed and I argue that you know, they have to gradually abandon a, a strong redistributive platform, partly because of new challenges. So moving from, the, from a platform based on universal primary and secondary education to a platform of what do you do with higher education in order to favor educational justice. You know, these are new challenges. So it's not that the, these parties have abandoned the poor in a, in a steady, stable environment. It has been a changing environment with new challenges and somehow they were not able to, to adapt their platform so as to keep ele their electoral support over the time period. Now, in the, you know, there's a, a particular uh, issue on which uh, uh, social democratic parties have, have been uh, uh, you know, not very successful, is to build uh, an organization of globalization and economic relation between countries that uh, uh, you know, attracts uh, support from the uh, lower and middle socioeconomic groups. This is particularly Uh, the case when you look at attitudes towards the European Union, which I'm going to turn now, uh, but this is true about attitudes towards globalization in general. So coming to, so this, uh, you know, this is uh, 
uh, attitudes toward the European Union as measured by the vote for uh, the Brexit in 2016. So on this graph, what you have is the proportion uh, voting to remain in the European Union as a function of your decile of income, wealth, or education, educational degrees. And what you can see is that it's only among the top 30 percent income, education, wealth groups that you have a majority support to remain in the European Union. So in the top 10 percent, you have enthusiastic support, you know, 70 percent to remain in the European Union, which is good. But, uh, you know, given that the bottom 60 percent is voting against it, uh, you know, it's not it's not so good. So when you show this kind of data in my country, in France, I don't know in the US, but people in France say, oh, but this is because of this crazy British nationalist, you know, what can we do with them? And actually, it's good that now they are out. And uh, well, OK, except except that, in fact, you have exactly the same pattern in France. So if you look, so this is the referendum of 1992. So as you know, there are two major referendums on Europe in France. 1992, this is the Maastricht Treaty to create the euro. 2005, this is the Constitutional Treaty on Europe. And in both cases, you see, so look, the, look at the green, purple, and orange curve. This was in 1992. The top 30 or 40% group vote for the yes. The bottom 50% slightly vote for the no. But because the top 40 percent vote with a large majority for the yes, the, the yes wins with a 51 percent margin. Okay, so very close referendum that makes the creation of the euro possible. 2005, here you only have the top 20 percent which vote yes, and, and so then the no wins with a 55 percent margin. So let me say that I, I voted yes for both referenda. 1992 was my first vote, and you know I am very much a European uh, federalist. But you know I think at the same time. We have to uh, take seriously what this is telling us. You know, I think you cannot say, uh, okay, this is a simple misunderstanding. Uh, uh, you know, we just need to explain a bit better next time and everything is going to uh, go fine. And, you know, when you have this kind of social divide about the European Union uh, in two different countries, you know, Britain and France, who have a completely different history with the European Union, and, and you have that at a quarter of century of distance, 1992-2005-2016, it must be that there is something in the way the European Union is organized uh, that, that is not working to the benefit of the, of the bottom and middle groups. And I think, in effect, uh, we need, we, what I try to argue in the book is that we need to promote some view of what I call social federalism, which means that you cannot have uh, free trade, free capital flows without any, uh, without any common social objectives in terms of uh, uh, tax justice, uh, uh, wage policy, social policy. Uh, and, and otherwise, you know, this, this is not going to go away. This is going to continue like that. And, you know, we are going to have more Brexit. We are going to have more nationalist government in Europe trying to take, uh, to exploit the anger and the, and the feelings that only the highest uh, 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 capital, in, uh, you know, human capital and financial capital group uh, benefit from the from the system this is uh, the i think the equivalent of the contradiction i've shown you before uh, about you know the the difference between the distribution of economic and political power uh, at the time of world war one this is sort of the equivalent on the political regime of today which is not a regime of competition between colonial powers which is an electoral regime based on uh, you know uh, uh, the, the fiction that uh, globalization is supposed to benefit to everyone except that you know the middle income groups and lower income groups are not convinced that this is working for them and this brings the system to a, a contradiction and to many different possible trajectories some of them, uh, you know, which are um, very nationalist, and, and some of them, as I say, that will be more in the direction of, of what I describe as social federalism. But the business as usual uh, scenario where you just don't change anything and wait for things to improve, uh, I think is not really, uh, not really an option. So you have this contradiction within country due to inequality within country. You also have big uh, misunderstanding uh, between countries. So, and I want to, to stress this because I think when we think of Europe today, and in particular the relation between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, we tend to look a lot at the uh, flow of European Union budget going to Eastern Europe. And so this is the green curve on this graph. And indeed, if you look at Poland or Hungary, you know, they have received between two and four percent of annual GDP flow from the European Union budget. And so, from the point of view of France and Germany, the typical attitude is, 
you know, why do they complain? You know, why are they, are they so angry? You know, they should, we are so generous with them. They should be happy. Uh, you know, we, we spend so much money for them. Except that from the Eastern European viewpoint, what you see is the very low wages in Poland and Czech Republic. You know, people see the wages on the other side of the German frontier and the difference. And the huge profits that have been made by investors in these countries, very often coming from Germany or France or Western Europe, uh, which in the end le leads to flow of, you know, outflow of private profits, which, as you can see, are actually much bigger than the inflow. Now, of course, uh, th this investment in principle is a win-win uh, 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 economic integration, but, you know, some people have won more than others, you know, and, and as you can see, the flow of profit going out, you know, are so substantial that it's difficult to avoid this discussion. So the French or uh, German attitude will be something like this. Wages and profits, you know, there's nothing we can do about it because this is determined by, by pure and perfect competition. These are market forces. We should not look at that. We should only look at the green component because this is the public transfer after the market equilibrium has been established. And that's all what we should look at. Except that, as we know, there's no such thing as a pure market equilibrium. You know, it depends on the institution, it depends on the legal system, uh, it depends on workers' rights. And, uh, you know, a recent report, uh, you know, a clean slate for workers that was done at Harvard University recently illustrates this, you know, the importance of how you give workers' rights to bargain over wages, the existence of social harmonization or no social harmonization in Europe. So we have to accept this discussion. And if we have a discussion that sort of takes has given market discipline as the only standard and then after the market equilibrium is established we only look at transfer as, as a generosity coming from the winners of the market you know this view of the world is leading to huge misunderstanding and and uh, you know this is a threat to just the very functioning not only of europe because you know europe is a little bit uh, laboratory of globalization and if it if it fails in europe you know it's it's not so good for other region in the world and, and for the organization of globalization in general. So you have the same kind of misunderstanding uh, uh, also between uh, the north and the south of Europe about the uh, public debt crisis. So this is the evolution of the interest rate on uh, the 10-year uh, public debt in Eurozone countries. So you can see that between 1999 and 2009, which was the first 10 years of the Euro, you had the same uh, interest rate in all Eurozone countries, which is what you should have in a monetary union, which you expect to continue. You know, if nobody is going to withdraw from the monetary union, you know, you have the same average inflation on the euro, so you should have the same interest rate everywhere, except that after the 2008 financial crisis, you know, you've had a lot of financial speculation. Actually, this all started when the European Central Bank president at the end of 2009, who was a Frenchman at the time, uh, said, uh, okay, if Greece is downgraded by rating agencies, uh, we will stop supporting Greece. Which was, you know, completely crazy because rating agencies had done lots of mistakes in the grades they were putting to private corporate bonds in the past. And suddenly you were giving rating agencies the power to destroy uh, the Eurozone, which was the most advanced uh, achievement of the European Union uh, after all these decades. And, and after this announcement, you know, uh, financial speculation started on interest rate, you know, going to 10, 20 percent, which is completely unsustainable if you start with a large level of public debt. So in the end, the central European Central Bank stabilized the situation and, and, and you had a huge monetary creation to stabilize the situation. But at the end of the period, you know, we still have a lot of misunderstanding between the countries and, and in particular we have different narratives about what happened and, and therefore about what we should do for the future. So in particular, you know, France and Germany who have close to 0% interest rate, again, they tend to look at Greece and say, well, look, you, you were about to get a 10% interest rate on the market. Now, we have been very nice to you because we have lent you at 4 5% interest rate money that we were borrowing at 0 or 5%. So, you know, we've been very generous. And, of course, the Greek viewpoint is different, which is to say, well, look, you made a huge financial margin against them. And both viewpoints are true technically. It all depends what's your reference point. Again, so is your reference point the market price of a country? So here's the interest rate. Or do you consider that sometimes, you know, markets are crazy and market prices are not so useful. And in this case, you actually want to close this market by having a common interest rate, a common public debt, a common Eurozone a parliament. You know, if, if in the US, 
Uh, the Federal Reserve every morning had to choose between the interest rate of California, Louisiana, New York. You know, it will be a big mess and it will not work. And, and in the end, this is not working, including for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, household uh, uh, savings uh, coming from uh, the Netherlands or Germany. You know, they get 0% interest rate. They get a long stagnation of the Eurozone economy. So in the end, this is not working and we'll have to, you know, to come with a better organization if we want to keep that going. But Overall, you know, this is the same ideological uh, contradiction as what we have for Eastern and Western Europe, is that you cannot just rely on market discipline as a way to organize such a large um, uh, uh, community and political community. So let me conclude, and I look at Peter to see uh, how much more he wants to... to five minutes, okay, so this is uh, exactly what I need. Uh, <laughs> so le let me come to some of the solutions that I describe at the end of my book, which are all based on sort of lessons of what, what has worked in the past, and in particular in, in the social democratic uh, regime of the 20th century, and how we can renew this thinking and this policy horizon. So I stress three main um, uh, ingredients in the book. One is educational justice. The other one is what I refer here as social and temporary property. Um, and, and the last one is social federalism, which I already uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, this is the idea that free uh, exchange of goods, services, capital flows must be made conditional upon binding objectives regarding social, fiscal, environmental justice. And we can talk more about this in the question. Let me say a few more words about educational justice and uh, social and temporary property. So what I mean by social and temporary property is the, the general idea that we need to rebalance uh, uh, the rights of property owners with the rights of workers. So we need to extend, you know, I think German Nordic co-management system with workers' rights, uh, voting rights of up to 50% of, of voting rights in corporate boards. By and large, this has been a big success. You know, in, in, in France, in my country, there's been a long resistance to that with, uh, you know, shareholders and employers claiming that workers, uh, you know, should be in the street demonstrating, but we don't want to have them on the board of companies and showing them the company books. But, you know, in the end, many people have told, uh, you know, French shareholders, but look, in Germany, this is what happens, in Sweden, this is what happens, and apparently this works uh, quite well, or at least this allows to involve workers in the long-run strategy of their company the, in a better way, and I think there's a chance that this kind of system extends in the future. You know, there's been, in, in France, there was one seat was introduced in 2013 uh, for workers, uh, you know, voting rights in corporate boards, and, you know, I think this is, this is very slow, you know, in Germany, Sweden, it's been between 30% and 50% of voting rights to workers since the 1950s. Uh, but I think now, you know, the diffusion of this kind of model and the extension of this kind of model uh, uh, could continue, you know, in, in the US, there has been some proposal by Elizabeth Warren and, and the US Senate. Uh, in, in Britain, there's been a lot of discussion. And sometimes, including coming from the conservative side, you know, Theresa May a couple of years ago mentioned that she was in favor of that. Partly for, maybe for reasons that can, are not always good, partly because, you know, in a time where you don't want to spend more tax revenue for social policies, this is a kind of social policy that does not cost you anything, you just change the bargaining powers of the different actors, so I'm not sure this is the best reason to do it, but, uh, but in any case, I think there are, you know, this could move in this direction, and I discuss in the book ways to go beyond that, for instance, by putting, uh, 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 sailing on the, on, in large companies on how many votes a single shareholder can have, not more than 10% of the vote in, in larger companies. We can discuss more about that. The other major proposal which I label temporary property is the idea that very large property holdings, uh, you know, should circulate across society. You know, wealth accumulation is always uh, collective and social in its origin. It, re it, re it rests on uh, public knowledge and uh, public infrastructure and, and you know, this, uh, you know, above, above a certain level, the accumulation of private property rights in single hands is, is not, uh, uh, is not useful in terms of uh, innovation and, and, and the common interest of society. And so circulation of power and property through progressive taxation of inheritance, but also annual progressive taxation of wealth 
can uh, finance for uh, for uh, uh, here I, I describe the possibility of an inheritance for all of 120,000 euros uh, at age 25. So this kind of proposal has been made a lot in the past. You know, there's a long tradition from Thomas Paine, uh, Tony Atkinson, uh, Bruce Ackerman, and others. Here's the novelty. So it's just in the continuation of this thinking. The only novelty is to use. Uh, uh, the inherit to both the inheritance tax and the annual wealth tax to pay for that so that you can pay for something more substantial. Here this is 60% of average wealth and this is roughly median wealth. You know, if you look, uh, you know, that will be the distribution of wealth in France today and it will not be very different in the US at least below the uh, 90th percentile. For the top it goes much higher. Uh, Uh, the av median wealth is about 100,000 euros, you know, but half of the population owns very little, you know, owns a few thousand euros or a few thousand dollars in this country. And so giving 120 to everybody at age 25 makes a huge difference for the bottom 50%. And I think transform the bargaining power in society. Because once you own, I mean, people who own millions may not realize it, but when you own zero, you know, you have to accept whatever wage you are proposed because you need to pay your rent and you know you are in a very low bargaining position you own 100 or 200 you are in a different kind of position you can create your own firm in some cases but you are also in a position not to accept anything uh, you can buy your home you are so and uh, actually this is a reason why the rich people may not want that but in the end if you want to rebalance power in society i think this is really key so i'm, I'm not saying this is going to happen in one day But I think it's important to have this kind of perspective if we want to think seriously about the rebalancing of power uh, in, in, uh, in societies. Let me st stop with the issue of educational justice, which I, I think historically is probably the main channel for reducing inequality and also for economic prosperity. If the U.S. for a long time was a, was an economic leader, it, because it was an educational leader, and, and the U.S. has ceased to be an educational leader uh, since the 1980s, and, and you know I think the investment in education, public universities in particular, is is uh, is absolutely uh, essential, and also setting new uh, objective, quantifiable, verifiable objective of educational justice, I think is particularly important. So we have a lot of hypocrisy about meritocracy. You know, we talk a lot about meritocracy, but this is what we have. So this is research from Raj Shetty, Emmanuel Saez, you know, linking the, the income tax return of their parents with the social security number of the students. So this is parental income, this is the probability to access college education. So it's almost the 45 degree line. Not quite, you know, if your parents are poor, you still have a 25% chance to make it. And if you are in the top 10%, you only have a 95% chance to make it. So, so you know, it doesn't go from zero to 100, but it's, it, you know, it, and of course, w this is actually an underestimate because when you go uh, to college here, you don't go to the same college as when you go to the college over there. So if you take into account the amount of investment, you know, it, w it will be even more spectacular. So actually, if you look at the case of France, So in France, you don't have these private universities with very high tuition fees, but you still have a lot of inequality within the public sector. So, you know, you have hypocrisy about educational justice everywhere. You know, it's not as if there are countries that can give lessons to other countries about this. You know, I think there's a, everybody has to, uh, to make a lot of progress. So this is public educational investment in France over your lifetime. So I take the court who graduate in 2018. On average, they get about 120,000 euros of total public educational investment from kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, higher education. But some get only 60,000, 70,000, some get 250,000, 3,000. So the people who get 60,000 are typically people who exit school at age uh, 17 or 18. Uh, uh, people at the top are people who go for very long higher education in the most uh, privileged uh, Uh, elite track, uh, grande école in the French context. People in the middle are people who go for two to three year degree in basic university tracks that are not so well financed. So in the end, you know, I, I told before about inheritance for all and, and try to have 120,000 euros for all in terms of inheritance. But in terms of educational investment, you know, some children receive 200,000 euros more than other children. And on average, they tend to come from more privileged background. Not all of them, 
Uh, here I have not ranked by parental income, I have ranked by uh, a percentile of how much educational investment you receive. So it's a different way to visualize the situation, both are, are interesting. Uh, but what, so, you know, the, the basic conclusion is that there's a lot of, of hypocrisy about the notion of educational justice. Now it's more complicated to define educational justice at the time of higher education than at the time where the objective was just to get 100% uh, of a generation to the end of primary and then to end of secondary school. So in a way, it was easier for the Social Democratic Party in the 50s, 60s, 70s to define what educational justice was and to carry an egalitarian educational push. It's, it's more complicated uh, today, but this doesn't mean that we can be satisfied with this. And you know, I think, again, we need some way to sort of uh, formalize and visualize uh, and verify uh, policy objective uh, uh, in order to define some, some justice objective in this area. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer your question. Yeah. And I think there is a, oh, there is a system. There's a microphone uh, there. So we have about uh, 25 minutes for comments and uh, questions and uh, elaborations. And I, I invite uh, any of you who would like to um, make a comment to uh, come up to the microphone and uh, maybe uh, just identify yourself uh, when you um, make your comment. Uh, maybe I begin, uh, uh, Professor Piketty, by um, asking you a very broad question, but it's a very broad book, and it's really more about the ideology side than the capital side. My um, uh, friend, the uh, sociologist uh, Michel Lamont, always complains to me that when uh, economists and political scientists, uh, she doesn't recognize any real difference between them, um, think about inequality, uh, we think about income inequality and inequalities of wealth, and I complain to her the sociologist, that when she thinks about inequality, all she thinks about is inequalities between races and ethnicities and genders and the like. And uh, since uh, this book has a, a very broad historical sweep, which of course you couldn't uh, uh, cover today, um, I wonder uh, if you have thoughts about uh, the relationship between economic inequalities and social inequalities. Is that mm -hmm. something that you've thought about in the course of doing this work? Yes, yeah, so fr from the beginning of the book, I stress you know, this, uh, the, the multidimensional nature of, of inequality. And, and so uh, to me, the, yeah, the social and economic dimensions of inequality are, are impossible to, to, you know, to set apart entirely because it's uh, in particular when I start the study of the book with uh, uh, what I call trifunctional societies you know, before the French Revolution, here, the inequality of wealth, inequality of property is entirely linked to inequality of function. So each different group you know, plays a role, a social role, for the service of the entire society. So the nobility is to, supposed to provide law and order, the clergy is supposed to, to provide some religious guidance, some educational services. And, and this is never completely, uh, this is always partly true, partly the case, not, I mean, not entirely, you know, maybe they don't use their resources as much as they could in order to provide educational services. But if you look at the case of the French Revolution, when some of this property is being confiscated, but without really investing at least uh, to begin with in an alternative uh, education or health system. Uh, in fact, you can lose some of these social services. So what I, what I mean by this is that the, the social meaning of inequality is, is always, you know, in all societies, uh, very uh, closely related to its uh, economic structure. Now, ownership societies in the 19th century tried to to distinguish radically, you know, the, the, the monetary right of property and always accumulating more property with the state power and regalian function and social function of the state. But in the end, this, this, this comes into a huge contradiction uh, uh, with lots of inequality and with the final uh, clash between 1914 and 1945 that is very well described by, by uh, Karl Polanyi in his book on the Great Transformation and the, the fact that economic forces were sort of uh, uh, separated from, uh, from, uh, from society and, and from their social meaning. Now, coming to gender inequality and uh, uh, ethnic inequality, racial inequality. I, I did not have time to, to present this, but let me stress a few, a few facts. Yes, mm -hmm. I have prepared too much. No, 
you know, you, we've had an enormous increase, well, pretty large increase in the uh, labor participation of women in recent decades. So you can see, you know, the proportion of women, if you take the proportion of women in the top 50% paying jobs, you know, it used to be 30%, it's now between 40 and 45% in a country like France. So we are getting, we go in the direction of 50%. But if you look at the very top paying occupation, Uh, and that's not only money, it's also power and, and the possibility to take decisions. And we know everything that comes with being at the, at the top of these uh, hierarchies. Uh, you know, this is still very small. So this is improving. So if you look the share in the top 1%, you know, it used to be 10% in 1955, 1995, sorry, 16% in 2015. So if we continue with the same trend, we should be at 50% by 2102. And for the top 0.1%, it will be 2,144. By the way, the, the figures are almost exactly the same for the US. We've looked at that with Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman in our most recent work. It's, it's impressive how it's almost the same. It goes from like 10 person to 15 person for the share of women in the top 1 person in the past 20 years in the US. So it's not particular to France. So what I mean by this is that there's a, a persistence of, of, uh, of uh, you know, gender inequality, uh, in, in particular, in access to, to, uh, to uh, top paying occupation, which, which is enormous. And here there's a, there's a specific logic that is going on that is, you know, different to some extent. I mean, it's related to the other revolution. So when you have a big rise of the top 1% share, in practice, it's a big rise of the top uh, male 1% share because they have very few uh, females. So, so the two interact. But, uh, but of course, there is some specific mechanism going on with uh, gender inequality, which I think has to be addressed with specific uh, 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 political uh, responses. And I, you know, I tend to believe that if you don't have uh, both for access to political uh, uh, elected position, but also for uh, top uh, corporate jobs or academic jobs or other top occupation, if you don't have specific rules, Uh, reservations, quota, whatever, you know, this is, this is going to, to, uh, to take a very long time. Now, regarding racial and ethnic inequality, this plays a very important role in the part four of my book regarding the transformation of the uh, electoral structure uh, in, in recent uh, years. And, and so, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the, the fact that in the US context, you know, the civic right movement has been described as one of the reasons why the democratic coalition Uh, broke down. In, in, my, in my book, I take a different approach. I think initially it's more the failure of the Democratic Party in the US or the Social Democratic Party in Europe to keep their redistributive agenda going that has uh, made them lose some, of, their, uh, some of, the, of the poorest voters. Now, that being said, it's clear that the, the exploitation by the Republican Party in the US and by, uh, you know, right-wing uh, xenophobic party in Europe of uh, uh, racial uh, inequalities, you know, has, 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 has played a more and more important role over time. And uh, I, I don't know if I have that uh, here. You know, if you compare uh, France and the US, okay, so you have some French in the C slide, but I'm sure everybody, yeah, Etats-Unis should be okay for all of you, I guess. Um, <laughs> I should change that at some point, but uh, anyway, what, what did we do, Art? I, probably you didn't do that one, that's my fault. Uh, yes, in the, in the book, I'm sure it's well translated. Uh, so anyway, this is, you know, if you look, uh, you know, in, in the US, the situation is pretty well known. So in 2016, you have 70% of the electorate registered as white, uh, 11% as uh, Uh, black and 19% as other minority. Most of it is Latino, but you also have the Asian minority and other minorities in there. And as everyone knows, uh, 89% or 90% of the African American electorate votes for the Democratic Party. Uh, the white uh, all vote for, uh, for, uh, for the Republican, or at least 63% of them vote for the uh, Republican. Uh, and uh, the Latino are in between. So that's well known. Now, what's striking is that if you compare the situation to France, so, uh, you know, in France, of course, uh, in, and, and, and you would have something comparable in other European countries, the ethnic structure, so to speak, is, of course, has a very different historical origin. Uh, there's, no, uh, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no legacy of slavery or much more limited legacy of slavery in the French context. But interestingly, if you ask questions, you know, do you have a foreign grandparent? Uh, 
you have a comparable proportion of the US in the following sense. So of course, these are different categories in the French context. Uh, you have 72% of the electorate who say, uh, I don't have any foreign grandparent. You have an out of the 28% who say they have a foreign grandparent. 19%, one nine, uh, have a European foreign grandparent, which is most of the time from Spain, Portugal, or Italy. So these are the Latinos of France, if you want, except that, of course, they are not Latino. I mean, they are not perceived as Latinos, and they are not uh, politically constructed as a, as, a, as a separate category. And in fact, they vote, they vote exactly like those who don't have foreign grandparents. So here, this is the fraction voting for, uh, for uh, Hollande uh, in, uh, in the 2012 uh, presidential election, with Hollande, which Hollande won uh, 51 or 52 percent against Sarkozy. And here, this is the fraction voting for uh, Hillary Clinton uh, in the 2016 presidential election. Now, if you take, uh, you have 9% of the population who have uh, extra-European uh, foreign origin, uh, uh, most of them from North Africa, 6 or 7% out of the 9, and, uh, and the rest from Sub-Saharan Africa, a little bit from Asia. Now, these are the percentage in the people who actually are registered in uh, electoral list. So you need to be... French citizen, and you need to be registered on electoral list. If you take the full population, uh, uh, the 9% here will be more uh, 13, 14%. From, but, but anyway, look, looking at, at, at this, uh, you see that the, the, you know, the, 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 the 9% with extra European origin is voting for the left parties with almost as the sa same proportion as, as the African American population in the US context. If you combine with religion, with Muslim religion, you will get to 80, 90 percent, and and I think this reflects, you know, the feeling that there's a lot of hostility from from the right wing party, and not only from the extreme right wing party, also from the so-called center right party uh, in in France, and explaining this. So, in you know, if you had if you had shown this to someone in France 30 or 40 years ago showing that there will be this sort of ethnic structure of the vote or racial structure of the vote comparable in some ways to the, to the US structure, I mean, with some important differences. I think, you know, people would have been very surprised 30 or 40 years ago. So what this is showing is that the, the Europe is, is moving toward a, a structure of political conflict where the, you know, the, the ethnic or racial dimension is taking an importance and a role and is playing a role that is not completely... Uh, 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 with no relation with the U.S. situation. So I, I spend, uh, you know, there's a lot more about this in the book, which I, I'd be happy to, to answer uh, more questions. Yeah. Michael Sandel, I, uh, because this is live streamed, you should walk to the microphone if you, if oh, you don't all right. mind. All right. Well, thank, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. The, the, question, the question I have, uh, Tomas, is uh, about the last thing you said and the first thing you said in the lecture. The last thing you said was about educational justice and about the hypocrisy in educational justice. And you mentioned in passing a hypocrisy about meritocracy in relation to education, that we don't invest the same amount in everybody's education and we don't provide, as your slides showed, truly equal access to education. The first thing you said in the talk was that every era of inequality has its justification in ideas. And ours seems to be, the justification for our inequality seems to be that if people work hard and if everyone has truly equal opportunity, which they don't, but if they did, then the results of the market economy, what people, the, the rewards people get, would be what they earned, what they deserved. That's the meritocratic idea. Now, if we fixed the last thing you showed us, unequal opportunity for education, if we could fix that and provide truly equal opportunity for education and for advancement, and for access to good jobs for everyone. If we could overcome what you call the hypocrisy of equal educational opportunity, then, then do you think that the 
underlying meritocratic rationale or justification for the results that the market dispenses would be acceptable? Or do you think we have to call that idea into question? Well, I, I think this will go in the right direction, but this will still not be acceptable because I think, you know, for, for the same level of education, the same level of educational uh, investment that you receive, you know, some people are, are going to be incredibly successful for reasons that are partly, uh, uh, you know, due to their own uh, attitude or uh, own choices, but also that are largely due to, uh, you know, to the rest of society and to the fact that they are benefiting from from others' uh, contribution. So, so take the example of someone, you know, who writes a book and who sells, you know, two million or three million copies. You know, does this mean that this book is one thousand times better than someone who sold a book of two thousand copies? Of course not. You know, it would be you would have to be stupid to believe this. You know, there are lots of great academic books which sell uh, less than that. And and in practice, well, first you have speculation, like on every market. You know, people uh, just uh, go for. Uh, for uh, you know some particular product for reasons that are not particularly rational and most importantly you 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 benefit you know when you write a book or when you invent a product or you invent a computer or a software you actually benefit from the ideas that many people have had and which you know they didn't put their property right on this idea so you know bill gates did not invent the computer by himself you know he had, you had thousands of computer scientists who who, uh, who did not put their uh, uh, their name uh, you know on the on the and did don't get their uh, check out of every invention that was used. You have all the public uh, knowledge that has been accumulated over time. So, you know, wealth creation is always uh, a social and collective process in its origin. And we invent private property rights. Well, societies invent private property rights to the extent that this, this, this provides a useful, system, a useful legal system in order to coordinate individual actions. And I think to a large extent, you know, private property rights are a useful system to coordinate individual actions, but only if private property accumulation is of reasonable magnitude. You know, once it, it, it becomes a, a extreme accumulation, you know, I think it's not in the common interest and, and therefore it needs to be limited by uh, law, including progressive taxation of wealth, including sharply progressive taxation of wealth at the top. But this also includes other uh, dimensions of the legal system, including, uh, you know, power sharing between workers and, and shareholders. And, and, and uh, you know, the general idea is that, okay, Educational justice is very important, equal access to education is very important, but it's not, you know, the life does not stop at the end of university. Life continues, people take initiative, make investment, and, and it's not because some people have uh, great ideas at the age of 30, or sometimes are very lucky at the age of 30, that uh, they should uh, control uh, uh, you know, all decision-making rights in their company at the age of 50, at the age of 70, at the age of 90. Uh, you know, I, we live in very educated societies and lots of people have to contribute to uh, decision-making and to participate to the uh, corporate decision and, and to the economy and to politics and to, you know, to society in, in general. So educational justice is important, but it's, it's not the end point. I, I try to in my, the last chapter of my book, to define a just society as a society where you want to have the, the, the most extensive uh, uh, you know, access for everybody to fundamental uh, rights, uh, in which I include education, health, but most of all participation uh, you know, to all social, economic decisions, political decisions of all its form, and, and that's... Uh, uh, so education is going to be instrumental to that, but... Uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, property ownership, uh, uh, you know, is, is uh, I think, a powerful way to change bargaining power in society so that you can do something with your education and you don't need to take any job, any wage in order to pay for your rent, which can be very high today. You know, even if you have a high education, but you don't own anything, you can end up, uh, you know, repaying a big part of your wage to to, uh, you know, uh, children of, of property owners for, for most of your life, so that's not going to be, that's not going to be enough. Are there others who would like, uh, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, Sebastian Royo. Uh, 
Sebastián Rollo, I'm a professor at Suffolk University and a visiting scholar at the Center for European Studies. One of the things that you saw in your book is how the traditional le the leftist parties have become less and less concerned with inequality and with redistribution. One of the consequences of that that you saw is that the traditional voters have abandoned them. And as a result of that, many of them have become almost irrelevant in their countries. Do you think that they have learned from their mistake? Do you think that they're ready to consider proposals like the one that you present in your book? Well, f first of all, let, let me make clear that, you know, I don't, I certainly, my, my position on this is not to say, uh, well, look, I have found the magic bullet and you should just adopt it and everything is going to be simple. You know, uh, that's not at all the way I view the problem. I think there are complicated challenges uh, and, and these are complicated questions. I am describing some evolution which I think sometimes are uh, overlooked you know I think sometimes there's some historical amnesia about some solutions that were experimented in the past so that's a way I view my contribution but you know I certainly don't say uh, uh, you know that the, the, you can change uh, this complex uh, uh, coalition in, in one day so what went wrong uh, you know I think with education you know it, it we the, the social democratic party did not realize that gradually the winners of the education system will become their prime supporters and, and somehow the, 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 the people who left behind, who were, who were, who were sort of below in the education comp competition will, will feel uh, gradually abandoned. You know, this is a process, you know, it's not as if there's one political leader who suddenly decided, okay, we are going to change alliance and we're going to change. You know, this happened, you know, supply and demand factors played a role. This was a gradual process. And, and now, uh, you know, I think if we want to change this, uh, we have to realize uh, this is going to take a long time. This is not going to happen. Uh, uh, but I think the only way to, to try to, 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 to change this is to, is to transform in a fairly fundamental way the policy platform that is being proposed uh, in terms of public educational investment, uh, in terms of verifiable public educational investment. It's important to set targets that can be verified. And also in terms of, um, of uh, more workers' rights and more uh, 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 progressive taxation. So, you know, I think in this election in the US, uh, you know, some candidates have made proposals going in this direction. And, and I'm thinking in particular about uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Elizabeth Warren. Now, you know, some people have the view that, uh, you know, the, the, you know this, this policy platform are too... Uh, radical and that a more uh, you know centrist uh, so-called centrist policy platform will be will be better I, I i must say i'm you know i'm not too convinced by this kind of argument what, what i find very striking you know if you if you look at level of electoral participation which is something i i look at also in uh, in this part of the paper uh, okay so this is you know, ter voter turnout in the U.S. has always been relatively low. Well, that's the first thing, you know, 50, 60 percent. Well, in, in Europe, well, here I only put France and Britain, it used to be 70, 80 percent. It has actually declined recently. You know, look in France, the la latest legislative election. You still have a strong participation in presidential election. But if you look at parliamentary election uh, in France, this has fallen a lot. But anyway, U.S. has, has a long tradition of a relatively low uh, electoral turnout. Now, what's more stri what's even more striking is if you look at the voter turnout by uh, with respect to uh, uh, s uh, social stratification. So you can do it with respect to education. Here I do it with respect to income. So on this graph, I compare, you know, the electoral participation among the top 50 percent highest income voters and the bottom 50 percent highest income voters. And so you can see that, you know, in the, in the U.S. you have you know, very, you know, you have relatively high participation in the top 50% uh, income voters, but the bottom 50% income voters have really very low participation. And, and this is something that has started to be the case in France and Britain in recent decades, which I interpret as the fact that, you know, the uh, new labor of Tony Blair uh, or the, you know, Socialist Party in France, you know, in the starting in the 80s, 90s, was sort of less and less able to convince voters uh, that voting for them was useful uh, for them. And, and, and many of these voters have stopped uh, uh, voting, uh, which in the U.S. Has, has been the case for, for a long time, well, forever, as far as we can measure it with this, uh, with this survey. So what do you do about this? 
you know, I think the only way to, to, to if, if, you know, if you want to do, to, to, to bring these voters uh, to, to, to the voting booth is to change the electoral platform, you know, so that they, they feel better represented by what is being proposed. And, and so, you know, I know, you know, there's a, and the other view, which I think will be very cynical, will be to say, well, there's nothing we can do. You know, these voters will never vote. Uh, uh, or when they vote, they vote for uh, Le Pen in France or for Trump in the US. And therefore, you know, we should not uh, uh, bother too much about changing the policy platform in order to attract them because they will never respond. Now, this is a very cynical view, which I mean, I understand that, you know, of course, this will not work immediately. So, you know, this may take a long time, you know, before, uh, you know, you are able to face this kind of very strong political uh, disaffiliation and very low level of electoral participation. But I think, you know, the only way to, to, to try to do something is to try and to keep trying in this direction. Otherwise, you run the risk, you know, I think the centrist, the so-called centrist strategy, you know, to me, you know, you first you run the risk that you lose this voter to the, to the uh, you know, Trumpist or uh, National Front uh, uh, Party uh, uh, in France uh, forever, and you have more and more, uh, uh, you know, of this, uh, uh, you know, this sort of appropriation by nationalist party of the, of the, of the lower class vote. And you also still have a very low turnout among lower class voters. So, you know, if they were really enthusiastic about Trump and Le Pen, you would have huge participation. And the fact that you have such a low participation shows that, uh, you know, most of uh, the these voters are actually not too convinced by, the, by, the, by what they are being proposed. But in the end, this very low participation is, is uh, questioning in the long run the very uh, legitimacy of our uh, electoral uh, democracy. And so I think, you know, it's, it would be very cynical and, and very, you know, to, to just uh, um, keep, uh, keep uh, you know, going in this direction and not, uh, not try to do something. So, you know, I think some, so, you know, the, you have different strategies, but, you know, I think by and large, uh, uh, you know, I am more convinced by the strategy proposing a fairly important change in the policy platform to try to address uh, this, uh, this, uh, this reality. Do we have time to squeeze in one more short question and answer? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Charles Mayer. Oh, wait a minute. That, I, I'm, there is a woman in the back, uh, Professor Mayer. I'm sorry. She has to go first. Go ahead. Is that, I can't see who you are. Uh, no, no, don't look around. Uh, it was you. This is oh, it's not a woman. You're not a woman. Right. <laughs> go ahead, anyway. You're young. Oh, here's a woman. Okay, go ahead, please. Sorry. I get into trouble when I do this, but I think it's, I think it's still fair. Uh, you say your name, please. Uh, Calidora. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask, I imagine you've thoroughly convinced anyone who thinks that inequality in and of itself is a bad thing. Um, I wanted to ask what you would say to people who might be more interested in growing the pie as a whole um, if they might think that uh, an improvement in well-being for certain people, even if larger for some than others, um, is good enough. Do you think that there is a fundamental difference in values that you can't overcome? Some people might just not care as much about equality. Or are there some points you can make, some data that you can point to that would be convincing? Mm. Thank you. Oh, but you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not in favor of complete equality, and I don't think anybody is in favor of complete equality. I think everybody can understand that you know, different people can have uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, objective in life, different jobs they want to use. They can have different talent, and it can be useful to have some level of inequality. So I think everybody, every ideology. I, I study in the book and including my, my own, uh, you know, uh, accept some level of inequality. The question is where, where do you stop? And, and, and here I think the lessons of history are, uh, are very uh, important. So if you look at the US uh, experience with this, uh, yeah, I just want to draw your attention to this uh, graph where you have the, the, you know, the evolution of growth rate in the United States over the past uh, 150 years, and the evolution of uh, the level of progressive taxation. Okay, so in, in the 1980s, you know, Reagan came with a new ideology, in effect, which was saying, basically, we, we are going to reduce progressive taxation, and indeed, top income tax rates were divided by two. You know, if you compare 1950 to 1990, you know, it used to be... Uh, 
more than 70% and it has, it has been reduced to about 35% on average between 1990 and 2020. And the, the discourse of, of uh, Reagan was very much uh, something like this. You know, we've gone too far in the reduction of inequality, you know, with uh, Roosevelt and, and uh, the progressive taxation at uh, 80, 90 percent, you know, this has to stop. Uh, we've, uh, we need to have uh, more uh, uh, energy to, to have more innovation and also to fight uh, communism. And, you know, that was part of the big, uh, big Reagan discourse. Uh, uh, and and, and the, the idea was, okay, we're going to reduce top income tax rate, we're going to have more, uh, maybe we're going to have more inequality, we're going to have more billionaires, etc. But in the end, this is going to generate so much more innovation that you're going to have so much more growth that income and wages in America are going to grow like you've never seen. Now, the question, and this could have been right, you know, as a, as, an ideal, as a political discourse, it could have been right. Now, 30 years later, what you have is the following, which is that if you look at national income per uh, capita in the US, it has been divided by two. Okay, so it's been 1.1% per year between 1990 and 2020. It was 2.2% per year between 1950 and 1990. So I think, you know, you have a problem of, you know, how you, uh, that, or you will need to explain, you know, if you still want to believe in the, the, the sort of trickle-down uh, uh, discourse of, uh, at the time of Reagan, you will need to find an explanation that, you know, the growth rate was going to be divided by four, but thanks to the Reagan policy, it was only divided by two because you had more vibrant entrepreneurs that made it possible to divide the growth rate only by two rather than by four. Look, this is possible. Everything is possible. But I, 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 I just suggest, you know, those who believe in this interpretation to make sure that, you know, they have uh, everything right in their argument and that they have all the data, you know, to make sure, to explain why the growth rate was about to be divided by four, which, by the way, I'm not saying that the, the decline in the growth rate, you know, is due to the decline in top income tax rate. I think it's due to some third factor that is not on this graph, which is, to me, the, the stagnation of educational investment and the fact that total educational investment has stagnated since the 1980s, I think is probably the main explanation for growth slowdown. You can think also that the uh, gradual uh, depletion of energy resources and the increase in energy price can also lead to some structural decline in the growth rate, which in this case is not necessarily a bad thing, because you can also say in the long run, you know, you have to stop uh, using energy if there's no more energy. But I don't think that's going to explain a division by two of the growth rate. I think probably the stagnation of educational investment. But in any case, what you can draw from this historical experience is that, you know, the increase in inequality that we've had uh, in, in this country since the 1980s was not in itself uh, uh, you know, very useful to increase, uh, you know, innovation or growth and, and, you know, you, so you have, uh, you know, maybe you have more patents, you know, some economists have written at the, how the number of patents, you know, increased with, uh, you know, uh, increasing inequality and, and, and reduced top income tax rate. But, you know, in the end, what matters is, is, uh, is growth and productivity growth and increase in income and wages. So if you, are, you have patents because lots of people put their name on, on lots of things, you know, including things that they did not invent themselves, but, you know, that doesn't, uh, if, you, if you don't have the, the you know, more, uh, more income and more, uh, more wage generated at the end, this is not so. So in this case, you know, I think we've, we've, we have more, we see more billionaires everywhere in the U.S., in the 2000 or 2010 as compared to the previous decade, except in the gross uh, statistics. So, so the, the, the idea that this was useful to stimulate innovation and economic growth, I think really does not stand really the, the analysis. Now, if growth has, had been multiplied by two, you know, it will be a different discussion. Well, then there will be also a discussion about, uh, you know, uh, sustainable growth and energy resources. You know, it's a different discussion. But assuming this is taken care of, uh, this will tend to validate, uh, you know, the discourse that, uh, the, you know, increase in inequality was, uh, was useful. And then, as far as I am concerned, you know, I, will, I would have a different analysis. I, you know, I will try to understand what we will see. But, but here, I don't think this is what we see. I think in the end, the long run engine of economic prosperity is much more uh, education and a certain equality in education. I mean, maybe not full equality, but... Uh, some, equi uh, some equity in educational investment rather than the, 
more and more uh, inequality which above a certain level is not is not so useful all right well um uh, there is a reception next door with uh libations and i think that um those of you i apologize those of you who had, whose questions i didn't get to you'll have a chance to uh, pose them to thomas piketty and it remains for me only to thank thomas piketty for this magisterial survey through multiple centuries multiple issues thank you very very much thank you